We need a dedicated tingle display shelf. <laughs> Got a trophy shelf? Like a glass trophy thing that is just a tingle on each shelf? Just one, just a mass produced plush bean butt tingle per yep, shelf. Just one, one bean butt. <laughs> You gotta get hyped for this out of thumbs. I can't look at you. That's the I've learned long ago that if I look at you, we'll Nick. never we'll never start. Nick, I have something important to tell you. What? It's June 9th, 2016. This is Idle Thumbs 266. I am Chris Remo. I'm Nick Brecken. And I'm Jake Rodkin. And I'm so fucking psyched to be on this podcast. I'm saying the F word like seconds into it. Man, uh, when I worked on a newspaper in uh, in college, yeah. it was a, it was the stupid alternative newspaper. And we were yeah. not allowed to put bad words on the front page. Not uh-huh. because of university regulations, but because the guys who printed the paper, like the guys who ran the printing press at like the local daily, were like, come on, guys. Our, our, our guys don't want to read this stuff on the front page when they're when they're printing this but if it's, <laughs> but they don't notice if it's on the if it's like deep into the paper i think yeah. like it gets through the folding robot before right. like they were mm. p- before they were bundling yeah. it up and they were like we don't want to look at the f word like right on the front page of this we don't want to we <laughs> don't you have, to, you have to start also adjusting your other editorial tone to <laughs> right, match yeah, yeah. what those guys don't want to be right <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to read about the environment we don't agree with come the on student body position <laughs> on uh the firing of dean <laughs> whatever yeah <laughs> mcintyre <laughs> Could you? Put Our guys don't want to be. Re- come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Our guys. Can we don't see a little more that. content about printing newspapers on the front page of this <laughs> <laughs> newspaper? Ink commodity prices. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on, guys. Can we learn? Uh, can we get some coupons for like good, uh, like plastic tape bundlers for large volumes of paper? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Why don't, why don't those any of your advertisers? <laughs> come on, guys. Sorry that I said fuck in the first three we seconds. Don't, our guys don't want to be reading these ads for the campus bar. Come on, guys. <laughs> We didn't put ads on the front page. What do you think we are? Uh-huh. Anyway, this podcast contains explicit language. <laughs> True. But mostly contains new video game experiences. I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know about uh, new. They're not that new. I don't know about new. Oh. New to you, though, because Nick Brecken played Overwatch, which I don't think you've talked about yet on this podcast. No. Yeah. No. Did oh, you... welcome back, Nick Oh, Brecken, thanks. After being sick yeah, or whatever the hell long, you were last week. It was that long uh, yeah, period where I was gone. Um, Admit it, you were just playing Overwatch. Yeah. <laughs> you called in sick to play Overwatch. That's true. Uh, no, I played Overwatch for like 20 minutes. Oh, <laughs> this fuck is, on. No, what, are we, what are we doing here? Oh. I don't know. No, I, I played it for longer than that. I played, it, I played it for a couple hours. I really want to talk about it with you, Jake. So I think I, I, think I kind of want to hold off uh, on a longer discussion until, until we can talk about it. But the, honestly, the thing... So it's a, it's, a, it's a really fun game. I had the same experience <laughs> that you did, Chris, which is that I was surprised that I was playing a game like that and enjoying it uh, in this year. Um, the thing that struck me, though, going into it, knowing that it had, you know, that it was influenced by Team Fortress is just how Team Fortress it was. Mm-hmm. Like, just right on down to like, oh, this guy has a giant minigun and moves slowly. Or like, this guy you know, shoots a grenade launcher and is fast and is basically the demo man. And like, wow, like there are just straight up moments where I just feel like I'm still playing that game and it just is a little more colorful. It's weird. Yeah. It's really strange. Team Fortress just got everything right. I mean, it, well, in the, you know, the weird thing too is the, th- like, I don't, I haven't, I don't read the internet anymore, but the, from what I can tell, like a cursory glance at like the reaction to Overwatch right now, it seems like people are mainly concerned about like the modes and going forward, like just for competitive reasons, like whether like the payload modes are are any good for mm. for like esports and things uh, like this. Yeah. And it just Team Fortress Two never really concerned itself with any of that stuff. Did it? it never did, but now they of course they have to, right? So really, like, is there TF Two? No, if you're no, Blizzard, no, no, I'm saying oh oh if oh, you're Blizzard, oh, oh, they, sure, yeah. okay, yeah. In this case, yes. they do. So like, yes. how do we fill an arena with this game? Yeah, and so it seems like a lot of people are are calling for new modes, whereas it's just it's it's kind of nice as somebody who played Team Fortress to just pop back in. It honestly just feels like oh, this is these are the modes I'm used to. There, I the one um, that's interesting. New modes that optimize for pro play. Do you have any examples of what the community is suggesting they push towards? Because I think more capture oriented things versus um, sort of like the the map that I played, for instance, was a um, that's true was a three stage uh, thing. And it was it, it just three stage, like three, three stage, stage in the sense that like it was the fallback. I can't remember that. Because TF2 has the one right where the map is split into thirds and yes. you have to defend a point for long enough or yep, that. And, 
Okay, that that, that, that seems thing. like that's the mode that is the most that, that like is gets competitive play in TF. Is it not? I don't know. Like that's the one where where a match is like a forty minute to two hour experience sometimes where there's just like where people that's, are just. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one that feels like a competitive game to me because it feels like playing StarCraft or something where there's this like push and pull, back, yeah. you know, between the, there's like a front basically as the mm-hmm. two sides um, try and gain ground. That that one feels like a competitive game to me or like, like football. I mean, for that, I mean, yeah. it, you know, it feels like a sport that that dynamic in that mode. Well, there's a couple in Team Fortress, too, right? There's a there's a mode where where there's capture points inside of a map and you're pushing forward or pushing back. And then there's also one there's attack defend where one person has a base. Uh, and one team is trying to just push through like four boundaries of a map, and there's like a right. miniature load screen and a respawn <clears throat> each time. Yeah. And both of those modes, both the sort of capture point push forward and push back, and the attack defend sort of unidirectional assault, feel like they could have potentially turned into a competitive game. Except that Team Fortress, yeah, just never gave a shit about that. It seems like. Yeah. Also, the community a community never formed around it. It doesn't. I mean, I, my, probably in early days it, there was more, maybe. I think but in like, early days there was more, more but of a thing. That, but yeah. It seems like Valve just never cared. Yeah. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. I again, I only glanced uh, um, briefly at the sort of uh, reaction from from that community to this game. But I, I wonder if Bl- what Blizzard is thinking about that <clears throat> because optimizing like this game has had a huge pickup and been embraced by people who absolutely are not angling to be professional gamers. Yeah, that's the or to thing form about it. like a f- clan and enter into mm-hmm. league ter- play like Overwatch. Seems like it's having a lot of this of similar success to Team Fortress early on, where people went, "Oh, I didn't know this is a game for me, but mm-hmm. it is." And if Blizzard starts optimizing it towards a more like MOBA esque uh, audience, that seems like that will yeah p- cut the early Overwatch adopters uh, or could. That's a tough. It's going to be a tough balancing act, I guess. Yeah, not knowing enough details about what about what that is. That's they're, just they're releasing like the competitive mode by the end of this month, I think, and that. Mm. We'll have it'll have the, the I don't know very classic Blizzard thing of seasons where oh, yeah. um, I think they're lengthening the seasons from a month to like two and a half months in this update, and then there's they're making changes to the way like sudden death works and stuff. I don't know they're doing a bunch of things, but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean Blizzard has a lot more institutional knowledge about this stuff than Valve does, and I think just cares more about it because yep. it. Cre- I mean, it like you know was hugely responsible for the longevity of StarCraft and. Uh, yeah, it feels it feels like Valve has since learned that. Yeah, between oh yeah, they were oh, Counter Strike Go, Go Dota too is and like, uh, Dota, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, for uh, sure. Oh yeah, no, and CS:GO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did find it really uh, amusing to be playing a game that is so influenced by a Valve game after having like watched the Dota two saga of just you know oh yeah like i hadn't thought blizzard, about that at all oh yeah blizzard blizzard suing uh valve over that and now man just like, I had not, oh whoops uh i guess we just put the heavy in our game what are you gonna that, do about it uh, well i mean everyone <laughs> else, uh, everyone's done like there's uh battleborn has like literally the heavy in it it has a wow, huge yeah. muscle man with a chain gun like mm-hmm. and his silhouette is like the tiny head to the huge shoulders with the gun coming out yeah. down to tiny legs. But yeah. um, it's interesting to think about Valve and Blizzard as the two like mm-hmm. stalwart behemoths whose games are just platforms and who run huge competitive scenes uh, now actually just eating eating each other really as their only new release. They're like, Valve, <laughs> yeah. put a new game out finally. Oh, it's Dota. Wow, Blizzard put a new IP out. Oh, it's TF2. Yeah. Like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's really strange. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Valve announces wor- both World of, of Schmorecraft. Both, both, like, <laughs> also, both both of those games, even before they were associated with those developers, were created by mods. They were by mods. modders. They were just mods. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. No, it's really, it's really interesting. Valve introduces new, way more inclusive. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> man! Speaking of that, like the so obviously a lot of the discussion on social media and so on about over. I mean, obviously there's a lot of discussion about just the game Overwatch, um, but there's also you know huge amount of just discussion about the characters and people like sort of memifying yeah. McCree and sh- stuff like that, uh, <laughs> yep. um, and. Just all that, all the shit that's going that that like you know that kind of I don't mean shit in a negative way. I just mean like that whole category of engagement, which made it really funny when I was reading uh, a news article about um, upcoming patches, including the new or the reintroduced competitive mode, uh, because the uh, the game director Jeff Kaplan is like talking about the changes to these characters, and it just sounds like he's 
just talking about these characters in the way that people on the internet do. Uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> I think Diva's buffs will take a little longer for us to get to, but McCree balance changes should come sooner. Diva's not in a horrible place, we just feel like she could be in a slightly better place. Whereas McCree is causing a lot of concern in the community, and we want to make sure <laughs> they know we're responsive. It's just, it's, it's, I just like, like it's, is that a character class or just a guy? <clears throat> yeah. Like, is yeah, he yeah. seeing his therapist? Or? I was just going to say, yeah, he sounds like a, yeah. McCree is causing a lot of concern in the community. No, it's really not acting out. No, it sounds like a school counselor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little McCree. This I don't know. Parent teacher, longer, the other kids, parent teacher conference with the entire player base. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Anyway, yeah, it's a good game. I want Jake to play it. <laughs> yeah. All, all, yeah. all people want. That was, that was Danielle's oh, desire yeah. as well. Yeah. Back when, remember back when Danielle was on the podcast? Good times. I do remember Now that. we mm. Now we got Nick. No, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I played another game uh, that I can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I played um, Warhammer Total War, <laughs> which uh, what is brought a fantastic that on? title. Uh, is, it, is it? When did that? Sorry. I don't remember enough about games that have Warhammer or Total War in their name to know when Warhammer <laughs> Total War came out. Like two weeks ago? Yeah, two okay, weeks ago. Okay, so yeah, like that is week, a new that's the, uh, the new one of both of those yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um I approached this game with a lot of trepidation. One, uh Warhammer doesn't interest me at all really. And total, But they're all the same. The, well, Total War as a series mainly interests me because it's a historical or you know, historically based uh series like it, the, the, that's the single reason why i started playing it in the first place um and so i kind of looked at this thing and went well i guess people are saying it's it's decent so but I, is it, i'll play it is it playing uh, the history of warhammer like what it's like does it no it's not well, it makes those no games those games aren't about the grand sweep of history they're just set in history well okay. they 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 are it's it's a blend it, but they're not a, they're not a like blend. a paradox game or but they're, something. they're still or, i imagine um, trying to model the feeling of that those yes. of those conflicts well yeah exactly that's what i mean what as opposed to being about like the entire history of the roman empire or something they're set in like an era of it yeah, right that's, I mean, that's that's generally true yeah but so i like mean the warhammer it, game isn't about the it's still like history of the warhammer large, world it's just set but it, in it's about warhammer that one world. time when those guys fought each other <laughs> <laughs> i mean the total war series has done things like in the medieval series for instance they had sort of you know crusade events that would sort of be triggered at different times mm -hmm, and there, yeah. there there was it's always it's an interesting thing because it's a sandbox game but then also there are these sort of like trigger points that they throw in where like certain events that Happen in history might not happen on the same year, but they just happen sure, generally yeah, yeah, yeah. to kind of simulate the sort of you know larger right. view of things. But in any case, um, yeah, I didn't really know what to make of this game. I wasn't excited about playing it at all. Turns out it's maybe the best Total War game, which is really strange. What? Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. I am. I was not expecting to like this game whatsoever, and it it actually I think is probably so the best. Remind one. people or inform people what what basically. The structure yeah. and gameplay of a Total War game is. So a Total War game is, is um, it's a combination of a grand strategy game played on an overworld map. Uh, you control a single, um, I guess, empire generally, usually, um, or country or what have you. Um, and uh, it's a total war game. You're supposed to go to war, and you you, you know the jet like there are different objectives, but in general, you're meant to just conquer most of the map, and then you win the game. Um, but it's a combination of that sort of overworld strategy, and then um, real time battles, which you know sort of most people are aware of the fact that total war. It's the game where you have a billion guys on screen, and they all fight each other, and it looks pretty and cool. Um, which you know. Fans for a long time have uh, whatever the real time battles, they're what they are. But then the, the grand strategy aspect is the sort of from game to game. That's the thing that people are you know mostly critical of, right? Like whether Rome is actually a good sandbox simulation of the Roman Empire or if it's just kind of wonky and doesn't actually play out like history would, you know, Total War Warhammer turned out to be, I think, the best game the series because they didn't have to do any of that shit <laughs> like they just like if you talk about games that are good because the theme matches the mechanics this game just entirely does that to like the like a perfect degree and like i still am not interested in warhammer at all really but just the fact that like it's not 
whatever. When you're playing Empire Total War, you realize like, oh, this is such a boiled down version of history, really. I mean, like there are things that as somebody as like somebody who's interested in history or things that make me happy while I'm playing that game. But like, that's just not how the world operated. Like people didn't just like decide, oh, I'm just going to conquer the world today. Like it was much more complicated than that. You didn't just like march armies across the map. I mean, I guess if you were Britain, you did. But like yeah, every, everybody else just kind of had yeah. other considerations. It was much more, you know, uh, in depth than that. And in in you know, Warhammer, it's just very clear. Like everybody's well, the, out to just go well, it's to called, war. It's called Warhammer Total, Total War. Yeah, yeah it could be. Wars and the name it's twice. one to one. It's it's the perfect. <laughs> it's the perfect. It's just a, uh, the name Total reflects Hammer. itself. Yeah, yeah. War, war. yeah. Total Hammer yeah. War War. War War. Uh, so War Total Hammer War. <laughs> so I think that. Um, just the fact that it, there, there isn't any disconnect between what, um, what you're meant to be doing and what the game is representing. And then also, um, they've just done a lot of things that just make so much sense. And it's just, the, it's the kind of thing that when I look at like a paradox game, I'm usually like hoping for. And then sometimes they deliver on just very sensible mechanics that sort of cut through all the clicking and garbage in a strategy game that just drives you nuts. Like, for instance, in this game, they added this mechanic called Confederation, which makes so much sense. But basically, so if you are like, whatever, you're moving around the map and you're conquering a bunch of territories. Uh, and let's say there's um, like a, 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 a territory that's next to you that's much weaker. Um, and you're generally friends with them, but um, they, you know... T- in another Total War game, the only way to actually conquer that nation would be to just go to war with them and take over their their um, town. Uh, in this game, you can just s- strike up a, a you know diplomatic conversation and say, "Hey, maybe you should like join my confederation because you're going to get killed by these other guys." Uh, so you have two options: one, I'm going to kill you, or these other guys are going to kill you. I'm the same race as you. Uh, we like the same beer and we like, you know, whatever our interests match up. Uh, yeah, it's shocking that this is the game that that was introduced to. It is strange, but it does make sense in the, I think it's actually down racial lines. So in right. this game, there are five races and they all um, behave in the way that whatever the Warhammer lore would like them to behave in the sense that like they're sort of monster type races. And then there's the humans and the dwarves. Mm-hmm. And those guys are like, you know, the, the humans territories are, are generally more favorable to each other. The dwarf territories are favorable to each other. And then like the humans and the dwarves are more favorable to each other than like the humans and the monsters would be. It's sort of a gradation of things. But in any case, you can just turn to these other humans and say, join my confederation. And then just poof, they are now part of. Right. You control everything. Right. And so it's basically. So it's not total war. Well, it's yeah, it's uh, yeah, true. Um, Warhammer, mainly war. Mainly war. 90 percent war. Um. Yeah, so like it just it cuts out ten percent lore. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> actually, a lot less lore than I thought there would be. In fact, almost no lore, which yeah. is another reason why this game well, is the, somewhat palatable. The funny thing about what you're describing is that there are, I mean, versions of what you described, I mean, do in fact take place in history, right? I mean, there's yeah. like it, not always necessarily along racial lines, but sometimes religious or sectarian lines, yep. and sometimes like just according to the dictates of whatever that era's views on things like ethnicity and race are or heritage or, you know, like uh, historical um, uh, sort of land rights and, mm-hmm. and government uh, uh, governance and so on. Um, but your, the, your baseline sort of evaluation of, of this game in, in praise of this game sort of feels damning to me of video games generally <laughs> because it's just it's like yeah, right. i'm just imagining like oh god real world is so complicated all this stuff is so hard yeah you can't make it oh it's just it's video ah just we'll just make a game about everyone who kills everyone all the time oh, yeah. and they're orcs ah ah that works so well our video games are so ah ah it's so appropriate yeah like it just i don't know it's like, true i guess it's just how it is i mean i i will always prefer and the the thing that you know like as a fan of the series i i see the sales of this game and i guess they're just astronomical oh, really? in comparison to other games in the series and it will make me sad if they never go back and and do another historical it seems like they would sure have they, to because the, sure the, the, the team making but... these is probably i mean it, i imagine both things are happening at once with them going oh man well we know where the money is but also 
we have the money now. Yeah, they'll probably you know, do so a they, parallel kind so of they uh, could, development scheme and, and yeah. do, do a license thing and a non-license thing. They could thing, make Warhammer but, 40K, Total War 40K. <sighs> it just yeah. depends because they're owned by Sega now. So it's sort of, yeah. it's kind of just the whims of whoever happens to be in charge. Toe Jam of the, and Earl, Total the War. that owns Creative Assembly. <laughs> 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 oh, man. God. God, how long until Sonic Total War? Yeah. Whatever fucking there's a mod play for that. that. There's, play, there's a mod. That seems fine. <laughs> Sonic and Mario. Sonic and Mario. <laughs> at, the, at the Olympic, Olympic Games. Sonic Games. Total War. War. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's all. That's all mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, I would fucking play that game in three seconds. Oh, yeah. Everyone would. No, a to- yeah. Yeah, I mean, a Total would. War scope game with that many just, just like... Stupid, tiny, cute Sonic robots and animals versus just a bazillion yeah. like, Mario characters. Yeah, like yep. thousands of how many toads like, were slaughtered toad that stools? day? Like, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> fuck load. <laughs> how many robots exploded into cute animals? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Yeah. Would you like to upgrade this also, building I mean, for a the, thousand rings? <laughs> at, that, at that point, Blur would also do the cutscenes for that game. Yes. And oh, a yeah. very particular segment of the internet would, oh, yeah. would just. Would just Die enraptured. Oh man, God. yes, especially when animes die in Sonic's arms. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't talk about anime on this podcast anymore. I forgot. Um. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm. It's cool to hear that it's good. I mean, you know, but it's my comments aside. Like, it is actually cool to hear that's good because I would never have. No, it's really, it's really, really good. That. The, they, I mean, they've done a lot of other new things as well. Like the the sort of like commander hero units are um, actually taken to the degree that you'd want them to be. Like they actually, so like if you're playing as the humans, you have like a um, a sort of uh, a command structure within your um, uh, um, uh, faction now, and you can you can say like this guy is the patriarch, and this guy mm-hmm. is the sort of Reich's commander or whatever, and that sort of imbues those guys with more responsibilities, and they level up, and then. Um, they have like inventories and like they also have their own like followers that then you equip on their character page so like a guy can have like his page and his like uh whatever it's it's crazy it's it's a really yeah well done um well realized game and then also it's it's uh you know for a total war game it 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 just is basically exactly in terms of the way it functions uh what you would want out of a just the the base game of it um That's so cool. yeah it does kind of bum me out in a sense that this is the one that they got right but yeah. uh at the same time it's still a really good game so i'm fine with it anyway yeah cool. games are dumb <laughs> you came into this from the total opposite direction that the sort of marketing department would have oh yeah for sure like the things like, i like about this game are not like skeptical orcs and humans yeah. <laughs> like i could care less but well, it's clearly the reason they made this is because yeah it's easier i get i mean i, I mean i say this as someone who as longtime listeners of this podcast probably know, like I played Warhammer growing up, the tabletop game. Mm. Um, and so it's been, I don't know, probably 15 years at this point since I played Warhammer um, last, maybe, 12, I don't know, 12, 13 years. But, uh, but I still, it's really like ridiculous how much of the like just lore and world I still remember. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so man. when you start talking about like a Warhammer based game, like I just already know all <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that in those deck in that decade and a half since I played, I'm sure there's a bunch of shit yeah, that I don't not. know about yet. Well, I'm sure that just the basic stuff's not yeah, gonna change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just mean there probably is because they yeah. introduce they have to keep right. you buying yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, so they introduce true. new shit all the time. Yeah. But like but I there's so many fundamentals of the of that world that i'm that are still just well, residing permanently i mean it's brain. all it's all goofy stuff but it's like it actually does free them up to just try weird things like the chaos warriors bleh, <laughs> like whatever they're just the lord of the rings guys that just come out of a portal but it's kind of cool because when you play as them you don't have a base or you don't have mm. a you don't have territory at all so it's, it's just a completely different set of mechanics and it's just i don't know it's just a weird like i hope what comes out of this game actually is that they learn a lot about like interesting things that can be done in the Total War game that they wouldn't have necessarily gotten to had they just done another historical yeah, game. Yeah, hopefully by, then, by breaking it down, by being yeah. able to abstract all this stuff out, they can then re- yeah. rebuild yep. it on yeah, the next historical an, that's one. That's an interesting point. But I yeah. mean, or we could get uh, Choo Choo Rocket Total War, which would really <laughs> distill it down. <laughs> right. I would play the shit out of that too. Yeah. <laughs> also, I just play the shit out of a new Choo Choo Rocket game. Come on. Yeah. Remember those? Remember that game? You, you just played... 
Choo Choo Rocket? No, I said I w- I want. Where's the new one? <laughs> oh, I thought you said I just played the sh- the shit out of God, the new Choo Choo Rocket game. Why is that? God, Choo Choo Rocket was so fun. Didn't we play that? We together? played that on on, the game, on the Game Boy Advance version yeah. of it with the link cable. We played a lot of of Choo Choo Rocket. God, that game was so fun. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty good. Forgot about it. Who owns that? Is that a that, that is Sega? Sega yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh? Man, that's kind of surprising. Sega owns. That, yeah, that there isn't a like. Version of that you can get on Steam. Or Where's that shitty free to play Choo Choo Rocket that ru- that ruins everything about it? Mm. <laughs> oh, it came out on iOS and Android in 2010 and 2011. Yeah, no one cares. <laughs> well, anyway, all right. You want to take a break? Sure. Video games. This episode of Idle Thumbs is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the biggest source of audiobooks you are going to find. They have over 250,000 audiobooks across every category of book you could imagine. If you go to audible.com slash thumbs, you can get a 30-day trial membership and start yourself off with a free audiobook. They've got like just about everything, including... Including the deepest cut of all. Harry Potter. <laughs> it's actually interesting because the Harry Potter books weren't on Audible for a long time, but late last year they showed up. Um, and if you're looking for an excuse to reread or re-listen to Harry Potter, this could be it because we have a Harry Potter podcast coming out in the next few weeks um, with me, Sarah Argadale from the Idle Book Club, and our friend Ollie Moss, who actually drew the covers for the audiobook versions of the Harry Potter books. Um, so. Maybe you should go to audible.com slash thumbs and listen to that or one of the hundreds of thousands of other things that there that are, that are there. Exactly. It's a good, it's a good thing. Yeah. And also I totally forgot Ollie did those covers. I just went to the audible.com slash thumbs, uh, Harry Potter page and saw those covers and thought those look nice. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I know that guy, and we are going to host a podcast with him on it, talking about those books. So if you go to audible.com slash thumbs, uh, you can get that 30-day trial, get your free book, um, listen to Jim Dale read Harry Potter, or listen to anyone else read any of the other books on there. That is audible.com slash thumbs. Video games. This week's episode of Idle Thumbs is also brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is a ridiculously convenient service that will send you a box full of ingredients to make meals at home. They send you the exact amount of the ingredients you need. They send you the recipe instructions. They are always delicious with really good ingredients. The meals across a week span a variety of different kinds of meat, or you can request vegetarian meals. What are a few things that you've had from Blue Apron? Because you've, you've been getting them recently, I've, right? I've been doing this, yeah, for, for a little while now. One of the favorite things I have made in many, many months was a Blue Apron meal, and it was a lamb and beef tagine over couscous. It was so ridiculously good. It had, like, chopped dates in it. You eat them. Uh, it was... I can't even get over how delicious it was. I did not ever cook anything. Like I partly because I was just kind of scared of it. Like I had never gotten over the hump of like just make myself put meat in a pan and cook it. And having Blue Apron show up with really easy instructions and all of the items like already parceled out and just saying, you can do this actually if you just do it. It actually it really helped me get over the hump of just actually like making food for myself because i'm a lazy person but uh (laughs) um like it was it was really helpful in that regard you also just have the amount of stuff you need and aren't gonna have like weird vegetables wilting in your fridge for yeah 10 days because you or or spending like 15 dollars on a spice that you're gonna use three pinches of or something like that yeah it's it's uh the way they the way they parse a lot of stuff that's really cool yep one quick thing about this if you're wondering how the food actually shows up it shows up in a like uh, ice packed like really temperature controlled box and you also can choose what day it gets delivered to you so that you can pick it that's true. to happen on a day that you're home like mm-hmm. that was a concern that i had back when i first started but it was fine yep um and if you go to blueapron.com slash idle whoa that's yeah i know right that's blueapron.com slash idle uh you can get your first two meals free with free shipping mm-hmm. free meals free shipping blueapron.com slash idle unique uh, promo <laughs> URL 
Thanks, Blue Apron. Video games. Are we back? I think we're back. You guys have been watching trailers on your phones. You apparently have been uh, learning about new game announcements. I think that, uh, well, uh, Square Enix announced that they're doing, I guess people could have seen this coming after Hitman Go and Lara Croft Go, but yeah. they're doing a Deus Ex Go. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it, I think it just was. It's it, it's new news as of yes. as of now, like as of minutes ago. As of minutes, as ago. of minutes ago. Oh, okay. Hot scoop, uh, Deus Ex Go. Except this episode comes out a, a day after that announcement. <laughs> it um, I probably still wouldn't have noticed. Not a whole <laughs> lot has been shown. It looks very cybery in its construction. It looks like it's a it's uh maybe triangle and hex based grid as opposed to the sort of uh all squared off stuff. And, but it that looks like sense. it looks like you're hacking things uh, at stations. You're taking people out. Um, it has the aesthetic of a Deus Ex trailer. Like the game, yeah. the game looks yeah. like the motion graphics work that would be in a modern Deus Ex trailer, where the world like splinters into into triangles and polygons and reforms itself. Like I, I don't know. I, I've I just tried searching for Deus Ex Go, and Google auto completed to Deus Ex Go and give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. So, you know, that's yeah. also announced. <laughs> okay. Apparently, uh, this is amazing. So, I don't know if you guys saw this, but a couple months ago, people first learned about the existence of Deus Ex Go um, by the the registration by Square Enix of domains for several games, including Deus Ex Go, Just Cause Go, and Life is Strange Go. Oh so, no! <laughs> oh <my laughs> that's a, that paints an interesting uh, portrait huh. of a. <laughs> those those are drifting a little bit. <laughs> Tomb Raider, Hitman, and Deus Ex are some of the classics, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. Just Cause Go could be bonkers, just right? Cause if you get Go things that be, allow you to just yeah. like skip across the entire board with <laughs> a weird jetpack power that's up true. that lasts yeah, for one no, turn, I, I, would, like, I would support that. Destroy yeah. all enemies instantly, but then have. Five more parachute in and random to random squares. Right. I don't know. You could make a crazy just cause go. There could just be additional airborne board that you have that you can access only by right. affixing yeah. yourself to a helicopter piece. Right. Um. What what happens when we get to Hitman Go Go? Like when they've cycled through all of their IP to the point that they get back to the Go games. <laughs> <laughs> Hitman go, Hitman Go Go. That's where just, it's just like Hitman that's, Go Go no, is like a game you find in Hitman. <laughs> no, Hitman, and someone's playing it. Hitman Go Go is like a 1960s spy rom. Well, it's like a very <laughs> yeah, right, austere yeah. playing board, <laughs> but there's outrageous the Go Go music yeah. playing over the top of it. Mm-hmm. Hitman Go Go is Hitman and No One Lives Forever crossover. <laughs> um, but yeah, Deus Ex Go. I I have not a lot to say about it because they haven't shown a lot. The trailer is just like you see one takedown, and then there's also a hacking terminal in the background and some stuff builds, but. I thought Lara Croft Go was really good, and they they did a a surprisingly good job of taking the basics of Hitman Go and then changing the way that the puzzles and encounters work to feel Tomb Raidery. I agree. I thought it was. I thought yes. Yeah. So I'm I really, thought but this series has been awesome so far. With weird spinoff. Yeah. Un- unexpectedly the g- great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to some cyber shit going on. Hmm. Um. Yeah. I don't know. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot to say yet, but whatever. Yeah, fair enough. Excited. Um, speaking of I mobile could... games, Uh-oh. I am still, I know I've talked about this already, but it, I, I think it bears further mention because it's just increasingly become the game that I'm playing recently in a, in a time when there are in infinite world. games to be played, great games that are out recently. I'm still playing Imbroglio on mm-hmm. iOS by Michael Bro. Um, Michael Broff. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Michael Bro, I assume. Let's just B R O U G H. Um, so you know, as I've said before, Imbroglio is a sort of one-screen turn-based roguelike game on iOS, and uh, I I just think it's amazing. I, I I think it's amazing for multiple reasons. One of which I think the gameplay is just incredibly smart and economical and compelling and clever and deep. Um, and also I find it incredibly endearing and charming because it looks so 
inexpert in the way that all of this guy's games do, right? Like 868 Hack, uh, this game, Abrolio, There, he's clearly not an artist by trade or or by anything else, really. I mean, uh, I don't even think his game, I, I think he could even do a better job at just making his games readable in a, but, you know, after you've played it long enough, that all melts away because you learn to read all of its weird visual eccentricities just because you spent so much time with it as I have in this case. And I now find myself sort of appreciating the inexpertness of the art because it, it sort of reminds me of what indie games were like before we had a segment called indie games. And before we had things like steam and Xbox live arcade, when people were just releasing zip files Mm. on websites and trying in some cases, trying to sell them directly through PayPal or whatever. Um, and a lot of times it was just individual people making RPGs that just were very badly illustrated because they weren't artists, but there was something about them that could appeal to a particular fan base or, uh, you know, or there was some clever mechanic in a physics driven game or something. And this, and, and his work just reminds me of that in a way that again, I think is just, is incredibly endearing. Like it's really it's sort of, there's something kind of novel, weirdly enough, in 2016 to be playing a game that is this polished on a mechanical and design level, but so, you know, I don't mean to say this is an ugly looking game or anything. I just mean that now when you think of indie games that really pick up Steam and find a big audience and are really polished on a gameplay level, like these days, you just kind of expect that they're going to that they're going to come along with a really well-defined art style that's been really highly polished or stylish in some way or have some sort of clever artistic conceit to it. And this game just doesn't concern itself with that at all. Um, and I don't think that all indie games should be like that, right? I mean, it's, we're in sort of a magical time for indie games spanning an incredible array of extremely accomplished visual styles. Um, but this is, like I don't know, there's just something really wonderful about how unassuming this game looks despite being such a great game people who really liked steven sausage roll uh and who like your opinion on games are probably really sad that they never heard you say all of these words about steven sausage roll because <laughs> <laughs> many of them could apply i think that's probably true um it's just not your kind of game it's not that it's not my kind of game i just i just eventually got stuck and couldn't keep playing it uh well, i could have but i just didn't um but even even the visual aspect is more specific to this game to me because this game actually is hand drawn. It's literally hand drawn. Like it looks like a guy who's just not really a great artist drew a bunch of monsters. Like it it literally looks like margin like school margins right. drawings yeah, yeah, yeah. if they had been turned into something that could actually be represented with fairly clean sprites. But yeah, just both this game and Steven Sausage Roll look to me like games that I would have bought off of someone's like Kaji dot com storefront that is circa two thousand three yes. or something. Steven Sausage Roll definitely does fit that that part of what I'm talking yeah. about for sure. Yes. Um but anyway, so now that I've talked about that part, I also just this is just such a great game. I Because I've already talked about the game itself in past episodes, there's a component of it that I want to talk about that I probably mentioned, but that has become like the cornerstone of my um, ongoing relationship with it, which is the extremely clever thing that the leaderboard, in addition to showing you the hot, the, uh, you know, worldwide high scores for each of the eight playable characters um, in the game, it also serves as essentially the uh user content repository mm. um like one of the one of the uh important elements of this game is that you yourself construct the board that you're about to play on using these individual cards and each card is a weapon and so each space on the 4 by 4 grid is a weapon that you use and so the weapon you use in any given turn is the one that you're standing on top of you don't carry weapons around with you they're permanently affixed to tiles and you place those tiles before you play the game. And that I think I mentioned on an earlier podcast is kind of a, that's a tough point for me because I, that's never the part of the game that I enjoy. I don't uh, enjoy that part of deck building games. I don't, you know, enjoy this version of it particularly, but this game has a brilliant uh, and very, very simple way that makes that completely magnetic to me 
which is that you can go down the top score list for any given character and it will show you the board layout that that person used to achieve that score. And then you can just copy that their layout to your and then try to board on your score, device. Basically. Yeah. Um, and the thing that is so it's cool in two ways, one of which is that you can see, oh, I see like the kind of strategies people are using to get high scores, but also in the same way that um, like the escalation missions in the new Hitman game recontextualize the level that you have already traversed maybe several times to do the main mission by giving you these other goals and, and styles of play that you have to achieve. Uh, similarly, um, going through other players' um, successful board layouts actually forces you to engage with different elements of this game that you may not have when you get sort of stuck in the rut of your own preferred strategy. So there's an entire uh, category of mechanics in this game that deal with uh, what are called curses, which is there are just various conditions that will cause an enemy to become cursed. And when an enemy is cursed, they just work in slightly different ways than non-cursed enemies do. Like there are things that will then turn them from being cursed into being a ghost, at which point they have uh, only one health, but they will go through walls. And they're them. way spookier. And they're, they're very spooky. Um, they're just, and I never found myself using curses for the first, you know, week or two of play because I found them just confounding and difficult to achieve. And, and then once I started uh, pulling down other boards that were much more curse heavy, I found myself really digging into those mechanics. And now I'm playing on a board who's, that is entirely contingent on just like, really going all in on curses and it's really fun and it's like almost a different game and it's so fun i just think this game is amazing it's such a great idea of how to do a huge amount with a really simple input system and a, a very small game space and it's just so deep and awesome and i you know the the element i'm describing with the leaderboard may wane over time as people sort of converge on dominant strategies but i don't know i i've gotten a ridiculous amount of enjoyment out of it so far and i think it's it's really clever also the, i think the way he did this because the apple game center api doesn't have any uh like method built in for just sharing data like this i think the way he did it is just by making your score a huge yeah. number that just includes, includes the like level a, encoded yeah. into it and so if you if you browse the leaderboards from game center it's worthless oh so he uploads a, there's a huge hash inside of your high score that gets uploaded yeah <laughs> and then he cut the truncates that for the in-game leaderboard. Yes. Oh, that's really like good. if you look at the top score, like so the top score on the game right now appears to be Frank Lance, which is amazing because Frank <laughs> Lance is the uh founder of uh now defunct, I guess, area code, which made Drop Seven and and some really clever social games. And and Frank Lance is also just an incredibly smart guy. Oh, he's just the top of my friend my personal friends list, whatever. But anyway, his like his score is like eight quintillion. 720 trillion i mean you know it's just it's hysterical looking in game though what is his high score oh actually that maybe that doesn't mean he's the top score that just that might just mean he happens to mm, he might be the top hash hash yeah <laughs> um it must be it must be him because i'm the second place on this leaderboard and there's only one person above me mm. uh, so i imagine that's him hmm. so anyway um yeah, it's just, I just love this game. It's Imbroglio by Michael Bro, and it's on iOS, and I don't know if it's coming to Android or not. Sorry to have uh, monologued so long about that. It's fine. I'm, I, In, I, inexcusable. I like, yeah, no, don't do it. No. Don't talk about games on this game podcast. <laughs> Instead, talk about reader mail. Ah, reader mail. All right, so PN writes, Hi, Assorted Thumbs. I've been watching Nick stream Dark Souls 3 for all seven episodes now, and I've come to the realization that the wa that watching the game is greatly improved by having one flustered person get pelted with directions by many viewers. Uh, I've spent quite a few hours watching people play games live, but the ones who most adamantly insist on figuring things out on their own have proven to be the least enjoyable, to me at least. This runs counter to the usual attitude of both chat streamers, uh, chats and streamers, which is that backseating whoever's playing the game ruins everyone's experience. Considering all this, I have a question for you. Do you think the keep talking and nobody explodes model of game design in which one person has the pertinent information for another could be expanded into a larger format that is specifically intended for streamed play? Thanks for the casts and the stream. Kair from the Twitch chat and the forums. P.S. Please glare at Nick for bringing a grown man to the brink of tears. <laughs> man, this, this this is one of the like 
all star chatters in your stream. Yeah, that's that's the guy. Yeah, he tells me what to do, and then I do it. <laughs> that's why he enjoys it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> it works. I like. I really enjoy that. I, I mean, mean, it's it's, it's not it's not a thing that everyone likes on streams, but I personally really enjoy that Nick <laughs> Brecken is my puppet. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, what the question was whether you could whether there's a ver- that into whether there's a version of this that could be baked into a game design. I guess is like what he's like a Twitch saying. plays X game. But there's also a person operating the game that has yeah. a, like asymmetric information right. between them and Twitch chat. Yeah, that would be really that interesting. That would be really cool. I I feel like yeah, you could do I, that. You could do that by having like web pages that everyone has to go to, or game clients that, or like on their phone or something that have tiny bits of information that you, chat then has to work together to assemble. You wouldn't even have mm. to do do it that way. You could have someone deliberately set up their streaming setup so that they're playing the game in a window. And then there, but the PC that is broadcasting the game oh, is running nice. the Twitch uh, side, and they're basically running a LAN game with what you see and what Twitch sees. But you build the one that Twitch sees to deliberately have a big hole in it that you plop the other person's game inside of. So Twitch gets the whole picture, and you're only seeing mm-hmm. your monitor, and then have a run a Twitch plays style bot connection into that game, like through the Twitch chat API. Uh, you could totally build a game that's deliberately about this, where Twitch is somehow manipulating. Yeah. I, I, well, so there's stuff. two different ways to do it, right? There's like, as you're saying, there's the Twitch plays where the people in chat are like actually feeding commands in that get aggregated in some ways. And then there's the sort of Nick plays Dark Souls style yeah. where he is trying to like himself aggregate and filter information yes. that's being communicated on mass by a bunch of Yeah, I'm viewers. saying you could have all those pieces running inside of of two pieces of the same video game running on two computers. So Nick is seeing right. one monitor. Then there's a, a a second like game client that's aware of what's in Nick's game and is feeding Twitch information and reading from their chat. Whether it's literally just saying, tell me commands and I'll do them, or like it's putting weird conundrums up that Twitch has to solve and then input the correct answer in chat, which then somehow reflects information back in a Nick's game. Like if they can figure out yeah. through weird glyphs or like another so, camera view how to <laughs> manipulate doors in Nick's world or spawn enemies into Nick's game, but they have to like brute force some sort of so it's essentially collection of, yeah. of, t- of like puzzles or a weird space team switchboard or something yeah yeah i was gonna yeah it's like space team it's like yeah basically just obfuscating every like you would just have them like um uh just entirely interfacing with that thing i would never see twitch chat period right, right. it would just be complete like filtering but if they essentially somehow- what you guys do while I'm right, streaming. If, if they we're could in all somehow the same either room, send you messages or manipulate, actually, you, manipulate, or manipulate, manipulate your game, manipulating the actual game is the is, <laughs> is the actual. No, no, that's, you gotta the, have, that's, you that's the version both, you'd want because right? you have to have Twitch plays the invader into D- Nick's Dark Souls game. Oh god! And yeah. then also, chat is trying to warn you or psych you out into yeah. killing right, yourself. Like if, if they if they somehow can amass enough something that would like create a little glowing beacon in your world that you might not know came from Twitch but would then decide to follow it and they would be so stoked that they somehow got you to sort of go <laughs> west uh, because of so, some horrible thing. So Nick thing is basically the cat and the Twitch is the guy with the laser pointer. Yes. <laughs> That sounds entirely. I mean, Nick is just a rat in a maze, and then they're like opening and closing doors or placing food smells in various places and seeing yeah. uh, if it yeah. helps you get out quicker. Nick you don't like, even know that there's an experiment. You just think it's your house. Nick is like the bean butt tingle, uh, and Ch- Twitch is like the couch. I like that we're trying to find. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just metaphor. Yeah, how Nick far is. down can you just lower me? <laughs> Nick is just a, a nothing, just a grease just, stain. Just, a, just a, doesn't even exist, really. <laughs> Nick is basically a creation yeah. of chat's shared consciousness. Yeah. Uh, Fandom is broken. <laughs> <laughs> you are merely the works of, of the, like, the, 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 you were brought to life by those who enjoy you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Nick is Salieri and chat is Amadeus. That's right. what I'm saying. Yeah. R.I.P. Peter Schaefer. Wow. Uh, that guy had a lo- good long life. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That would be a frustrating game to build, but it would also probably be really satisfying for the like two times that you actually run it. <laughs> it would have to be an event. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it would be a That would be a, that would be, be a, a, didn't someone make a game jam game that was like exp- I think I think Rami Ismail made a game that was that was only playable through Twitch. That would actually be a good jam for Twitch itself to host to host a Twitch oh, jam where it's yeah. like you have to incorporate chat um the chat API really into cool. your game somehow. And then have then get big Twitch streamers to all run yeah. through X number of uh, Twitch jam games. Yeah. 
Are you? What do you, you think? You're still you're still gonna keep going with the uh, yeah Dark Souls? Yeah, yeah. I didn't do it this week because I was hungover. But uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, it's, yeah. But I'll I'll keep I'll keep plugging away. You got to beat. I got to beat that game. I got to beat the souls. So, do you know how far you are? I don't. Okay, which is scary. Chat will tell you when you're getting close to the end. Probably. I know I'm more than halfway at least, but I I I, I don't know. Past that, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, well, we, speaking of streams, we actually, uh, we should have mentioned this at the beginning probably, but this Saturday we are doing our big wizard jam stream. We've been figuring out all the logistics for, for how to make that work. And I think it'll, I think it will, it will work. So that will be this Saturday, uh, June, what, uh, 11th at, we're going to say noon Pacific time. So that is at twitch.tv slash idle thumbs noon pacific time on saturday june 11th yeah our we're plan is play to through all those games we're gonna run through all the games people made as part of the wizard jam the idle thumbs community game jam uh there's some real good stuff in wizard jam this I'm year i'm so excited i've still basically kept myself ignorant of almost all of them which has been really hard to achieve yeah but i there's some very there's some awesome stuff i've been sampling stuff because i'm i'm you're trying to figure out what the i'm trying to actually yeah. p- assemble them so we can p- play all of them properly yeah. Yeah. uh i'm trying to reduce the amount of time on the stream that is us figuring out which controller we're supposed to have plugged in and whatever else right um yeah yeah i'm really excited that'll be really fun and then i don't know maybe sometime before or then or after then nick will do another dark soul stream mm-hmm. gotta get another uh multi-person dark soul stream yeah it'd be fun yeah you've been drinking alone on these dark souls and tiki drinks streams yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) man i just got speaking of tiki drinks i just got the uh i saw this book in the mail i didn't know that existed that book it just came out this week oh wow yesterday smuggler's cove the book smuggler's cove is is this amazing rum and tiki bar in san francisco and they like they put out a book that has Every recipe on their menu, I think, or close. I don't like, think it has every recipe on their it's menu. It's close, I think, but it, I th- yeah, it has about a hundred recipes. It's a lot of recipes. Yeah, yeah. and um, the so I didn't really know what this book was going to be, honestly, but I just ordered it because it actually was shockingly inexpensive for a hardcover book. And as it turns out, it's really, really nicely produced, and it's not even what I expected. I mean, it's a lot about the history of tiki, and uh, it's not even really about Smuggler's Cove itself at least not mainly, it's just about a lot of things related to tiki drinks and tiki culture. And there's also a whole section on like how to throw a tiki party and how to appoint your tiki bar and stuff. So we can definitely pick up some tips. It's good. Tips and tricks. Yeah. To help out those streams. If we get back to the, uh, that, that, uh, original expression of that stream series. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, we did not say this at the beginning of this section, but if you have a question for us or weird, uh, booze uh, book recommendation. You can write to questions at idlethumbs.net and we will read it. That's true. <sighs> Chris has turned into Idle Shrubs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. If you haven't seen Idle Shrubs, where do you even go? How do we even just direct people to Idle uh, Shrubs? I don't uh, know. I don't there, know. There's someone who has shown up on, on YouTube, some pseudonymous person going by Idle Shrubs, who a few weeks ago uploaded one video and then two days ago uploaded another video. Each of these videos is a brief clip, 30 to 60 seconds. Each of these videos yeah, is a from brief that, clip from each of these for is, about 60 seconds. Yeah. These are clips from yeah. Idle Yeah. <laughs> If you just type in Idle Shrubs YouTube into Google, you will find whatever this is. It's just, it's a strange talking animated (laughs) Christmas wreath, but it reads out like slowed down drunk versions of clips from our show. It's very weird. This this person was momentarily banned from our forums for spamming YouTube links, which was not intentional. Sorry about that. Your ban has been un... If you're listening to this, Idle Shrubs, your ban has been revoked. You are, once again, free to post on our forums. Please continue. Oh, I thought this was his retribution. I thought I thought you were saying he's no, been banned. No, 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 no. no, no. Like, no, no. It's, in- <laughs> it's, because, it's because accounts that do nothing, that silently just post YouTube links across uh, yeah, multiple yeah, yeah. threads get flagged. Got it. Um, <laughs> it's okay. You can continue now, Idle Shrubs. We appreciate the valuable work you're doing. <laughs> it's really strange. Yeah. It's really good. Uh, anyway, so... Um, that's not anything, but uh, 
You want to do some more reader mail? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Very much. So, Idle Shrubs writes. <laughs> Olivia B. writes, Jeff Goldblum News. Hi, Thumbs. I've attached a picture which I feel will be of interest to you. This is the cover of this month's issue of Empire, a British film magazine. Oh, wait, this is guy In order to promote Independence Day resurgence, they've decided on a picture of Jeff Goldblum being forcibly strangled or lovingly embraced by an alien. I saw it in the grocery store the other day and knew I had to send it in. I can only hope you guys find this as amazing as I did. Keep up the good podcasting, Olivia. Oh, it's this- so good. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum, it, it, it's like... <laughs> It, it's, it's it's like all it's it's oh like a weird yeah, alien yeah, yeah, tentacle yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. it's just super gratuitously like cinematic photo shoot lit but Goldblum just looks like he does not give a fuck yeah he's just like oh well there's an alien uh, <laughs> he's, an alien he's, tentacle he's, yeah. he's about as least affected yeah. by big tentacle alien literally mm-hmm. strangling him than a human being could well what do you think they told him that was going to be originally <laughs> <laughs> versus Goldblum. what was they were yeah. just they, they, there were, was just, they were truthful but <laughs> that was a picture of him and his wife originally Jeff Chris. Goldblum you're confronting an alien <laughs> right. uh, 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 uh. yeah here's your inspiration I, I you're being strangled that, uh, by having, is, it, is it a slimy having gone through uh, this slimy? experience once already right. my character would be uh, mm, uh, meet this experience with a um, uh, steely resolve uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah oh god it's so good yeah. he's got his like salt and pepper hair and his like thick glasses and mm-hmm. oh man yeah he played that alien a, a jazz uh solo and then and then that <laughs> photo occurred he played, a, he played this alien a tasteful jazz solo yeah. while being strangled yeah, apparently. Yeah. That's, <laughs> right. that's how cool he is about right. this experience. that's actually the alien giving him a hug because it enjoyed <laughs> right yeah his tunes <laughs> right yeah. yeah that's uh that's a great set jeff yeah. oh and thanks the weird alien thing is friend he had, to, he had to pose for this including like putting his hands up as though he were mm-hmm. he were yeah fending it off but man what a strange photograph anyway if you look up empire's um jeff goldblum cover you will you will find this also the topography on this is just (laughs) aliens attack again in just like aerial bold (laughs) bright red sorry but it's this this is impressive um okay so uh speaking of youtube johnny driggs writes hello thumbs it's me johnny driggs the guy who does your youtube videos Recently, due to fan demand, I uploaded a compilation of the Steam Hat Economy reader mails from Captain Invictus to YouTube.com slash idle videos. A lot of people seem to enjoy it, and some ask for more compilation videos. Of course, you all know this, but I thought you could help me by asking for compilation requests from readers. I think the next one I'm going to put up is the bizarre tale of Chris's lingerie phone sex fallout shelter. After that, I'd like to hear from fans as to what they'd like. Readers can tweet their requests to me at at Johnny Driggs. That is at J-O-H-N-N-Y-D-R-I-G-G-S. Please write in with what you would like to see. It doesn't even need to be a series of discussions. Just send any memorable bits from Idle Thumbs that you would like to have an easy way to share with your friends. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah, it's really cool. I had been hoping people or someone would do this for a while, and I'm glad that Johnny is doing it and it's going out on the Idle Thumbs channel. The... um. If you don't remember or want a refresh on that Hat Baron stuff, it is totally wild and worth going back and listening mm-hmm. to. It's some of the craziest look into like weird meta uh, shadow economy in online gaming. And um, Captain Invictus actually wrote us with an epilogue to this, which I will save for next week when everyone can come back refreshed on the saga yeah, of the Hat Baron. So, oh man, yes, enticing. Yes. Oh, also if. Uh, so the, the hat Baron stuff is like a very long and chunky, you know, it's spanned multiple episodes. It was an epic tale, but, um, you know, also hit up Johnny Driggs. If there are shorter discussions that you think would be fun to be able to share around with your friends to show them some just like funny, interesting thing from our podcast. We don't remember that stuff usually, but he would, because he annotates every single episode for our YouTube channel. Um, every single episode of idle thumbs to date is up on our YouTube channel with incredibly scrupulously um, annotated lists of uh, discussions and timestamps. Yeah, timestamps you can jump to and stuff. Yeah. It's very cool. So thank you, as always, Johnny Driggs, yeah, for your thanks, tireless Johnny. service. That guy's cool. Uh, Joey Perlman writes, In his book Zona, Jeff Dyer has a quote from the Soviet director Tarkovsky of Solaris, Stalker, Nostalgia, The Mirror, etc. Describing his uniquely slow panning shots, he says, 
If the regular length of a shot is increased, one becomes bored. But if you keep on making it longer, it piques your interest, and then if you make it even longer, a new quality emerges, a special intensity of attraction. End quote. I've seen it called Tarkovsky's theory of time pressure, and there's a more in-depth article about his style here. He has a link to something on offscreen.com. And they have a nice, nice comparison between Tarkovsky's style and Eisenstein's Soviet montage theory. He says, Tarkovsky believed the film image not to be a composite of different shots arranged in a structure within a specific sequence progressing in time. He reasoned that if the film image is not a composite, then the dominant factor of the film must be its rhythm. Rhythm is at the core of the poetic film. But Tarkovsky's idea of rhythm is not that of Eisenstein. Instead, he envisioned cinematic rhythm as a movement within the frame, not a sequence of shots in time. So the main characteristic of poetic film is a process of sculpting in time as opposed to montage of attractions. Um, while Eisenstein's process of editing is guided by a juxtaposition of images, Tarkovsky's time sculpting involves editing techniques which allow spontaneous unification of the shot as a self-organizing structure. Um, for Tarkovsky, it is time that rules dictating the editing techniques. So he goes on, I remember hearing you guys talking several years ago about video games finding their version of tools such as cinematic montage or free indirect discourse or free indirect speech. And I was wondering if you thought there's a place for Tarkovsky's time dilation in games. I think the most direct comparison would be the genre of going around games, a.k.a. walking simulators. Credit to the One Life Left One Life Left podcast for the far superior name of the genre. But the main criticism about that genre is that they uh, can easily become not very interesting. That criticism was often directed at Dear Esther, which is, uh, and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which may be the most Tarkovsky-esque games out there. Co Alternatively, could gaming's version of time pressure be extreme repetition? Games like Super Hexagon, Dark Souls, and Quop use repetition to create a similar experience with the basic reaction to Tarkovsky's shots of, this new thing is immediately interesting, to, I'm bored with this thing, to, maybe I just didn't grasp the de depth before, to, this thing is actually the most interesting thing ever. P.S. Could you update the about page to have email addresses for all the shows on the network? Uh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. P.P.S. The audiobook of The Thousand Autumns of uh, Jacob DeZoet pronounces the name as Jakob DeZoet. Thought you might want to know after the whole Jesper Yule thing. Thanks, Joey Perlman. That was an all around good email. Yeah, that yeah, was, that was including intense. the part where we were shamed for right. not listing. It was a very poetic uh, uh, email. Could that you make sort of in a... your website not bad? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> we do not currently have the ability to do that. We those, can maybe figure that those out. Those two different interpretations, uh, like the the long shots of walking simulators versus the repetitive tasks uh, of games, it's really interesting. It's really good. Yeah, it's yeah. good. It's interesting that we apparently years ago talked about cinematic montage in like the equivalent of cinematic montage in games because we ended up just basically doing literally that in Firewatch. I wonder if we talked about that around 30 Flights of Loving, which Probably, was which a cinematic yeah. montage then the direct of a game. Yeah. On, yeah, on Firewatch, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. The the I could be wrong, but it feels like the repetition of sort of short gameplay mechanics, it doesn't feel quite the same to me because the, those generally work by trying to hook you in as quickly as possible rather than trying to push you past sort of an initial repellence or or boredom but i i don't know maybe i don't mm. i'm not sure i don't know like i i feel like the the version of it in games is sort of the opposite where you start off like kind of enjoying it and then you actually like get even more into it and then like 20 hours later you're sort of filled with a hollowness of like what the hell have i just spent but there's a place in between in doing. in games that have repetitive mechanics that offer depth where you end up pushing through to a point of like it's like a flow Greater or bliss states or just yeah, yeah sort yeah. of like i like I mean, i'm probably in that where right you now you, you, you can you can hit yeah you can hit a point where suddenly like the depth that is actually contained inside of this seeming simplicity uh is made apparent to you yeah uh, but then, yeah, <laughs> at a certain point, maybe then it does also end up being right. hollow when you realize well, I mean, the big difference is you're that not eating anymore because you're just doing yeah. this one <laughs> thing over and over again. I mean, the, the big difference is that every movie, even a sort of seemingly interminable Tarkovsky movie, still just ends, period. And some games do, but some games don't. Uh, yeah. You know, so I don't know. It's hard. That stuff is always very... I, I think I used to be a lot more into trying to find analogs between film and games. And I think I'm increasingly, I think I increasingly abandon that um, as something with a huge amount of utility. Um, 
but I don't know. Maybe I'll swing back around on that in another couple of years. Who knows? Um, but it's, it was an interesting thought exercise. Uh, so Niav Schoner, which I think I'm pronouncing right at this point, because I think I just after this person has written in a few times, uh, says, hey, thumbs. I was watching these videos. I was watching videos about the actual real number generation results from coin flips and card shuffling. Basically, how random are these things actually, which is in general pretty fascinating. But then in this one, he starts talking about how high level bridge players had intuitively figured out that people don't shuffle card decks enough and use it to their advantage. And I thought of you guys. Uh, and then there's a YouTube link. As I said, the entire series is pretty fascinating if you have the time. So I figured I'd share it. Best, Niav. Um, I watched this linked video and then another video that was followed in the series. And I could have kept watching them if it weren't like 1230 AM. But uh, this is, this is really fascinating. There's a weird. So apparently for just an incredibly long period of time, historically uh, casinos and just people, you know, all just generally just did not shuffle cards i mean just people in general just do not shuffle cards enough like people think they've shuffled cards sufficiently and they have not like it's um uh and and this is something that uh, that uh you know was just an institutional problem at casinos for decades and decades and decades and the casinos just did not know this because that was sort of priced into the market so to speak right like all of their profit margins were just built around this insufficient shuffling but it meant that people who were either aware of this or were just ex- high level players who maybe weren't aware that they were aware of it, but had an intuitive understanding of sort of the dynamics is probably going to come up soon. Yeah. Or just like maybe probably less specific than that. I mean, that's a card counting thing, which is also yeah. important, but like, but just general patterns. And there was a really interesting example of that, that he gave like where you see shadows of previous hands come back into play or like how, so, how so specifically? Here's, uh, here's an example. Here's an example. So this is crazy uh, and it makes sense. But I would never, would never in a million years have occurred to me. So bridge is a game that is dealt out in four equal, four equally sized hands to four people. So you deal out the entire deck. What this, there are four suits also. Um, what this, cards also get played in clumps according to their suit. So as you deal, as you play the cards out, cards of similar um, suit end up clumped together, Right in like, let's say groups of four, they go back into the deck. You find, you finish the game, you put the whole deck back together. The deck is then like sorted basically into roughly, uh, distributed clumps of suits. Yeah. You then shuffle the deck. You don't shuffle the deck, um, sufficiently. You shuffle it. You think it's sufficient it still basically has those clumps in there. When you then deal the deck back out, it appears to be in an even distribution because what you're doing is you're taking those clumps and spreading them out among the four people. The crazy thing about this is once you actually start shuffling the decks with a computer that is precisely correct, or or I mean, not like statistically true, right? Like that is actually weighting the distribution accurately as in as in a way that is close to true randomness as possible it actually appears once you deal the decks back out to be less well shuffled because the way you deal it out goes around the table in a group of four which is actually sort of returning the clumping Mm -hmm. back in to the random shuffle does that make sense yeah yeah it's the crate it's so bananas and so once once a professional bridge competitive play tournaments started introducing computer shuffled decks bridge players who are familiar with these imperfect shuffling patterns for decades once they were dealing with more accurately shuffled randomized decks it felt to them as though the decks were actually becoming more stacked and they were very confused by this and so for a long time um uh high-end bridge players had sort of like adjusted their uh, their sort of int- intuitive awareness of these shuffling patterns to improve their play as like, they sort of ba- tried assuming to infer- everyone has kind of balanced yeah, hands. yeah isn't that interesting crazy? yeah that's really yeah. good so interesting yeah and then he yeah and then he started he there was a whole another video with the same guy talking about he's a mathematician math and math researcher and he was um talking about um 
coin flipping and the sort of the way that distribution works. I don't know. That, it's very, very, very interesting. Um, actually, let me just click on the link so I can see the title of it so people can watch it if they want. Um, the, the specific video that was linked to is Shuffling Extra Footage, three out of three, Percy Diaconis, which is P-E-R-S-I-D-I-A-C-O-N-I-S. So anyway, uh, anyway, he, I guess this guy proved that seven shuffles is how many, you, mm. seven proper shuffles is good, is, is what you need for 52 cards. And he actually proved that mathematically. Uh, which is interesting. So, yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, none of us probably have any actual like things to add to that because none of us are mathematicians. But no, it was really cool. Yeah, it was really really interesting. Yeah, that stuff's really cool. And that probably happens I, at all competitive levels of everything. You know, where there is like physical, mathematical, statistical, um, or biological principles going on that like we sort of in our idealized world like to think of as having less impact because we like to think of things as being sort of like perfectly constructed and, and meritocratic and so on and so on. But there's all these like just facets of imperfection in the world that people just. Oh yeah. If you want to, if you want to realize the imperfections of computer randomization, just watch a speed run once. <laughs> well, that's a different story. <laughs> that's but a different yeah. story, but, but yeah, it's still also that's the equivalent just like for video games. It's yeah. still also a yeah. very, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Is that it, do you think, for the podcast? That's probably it for sure. the podcast forever. Yeah. All right. Thanks well, for listening to the last ever Rattle Thumbs. <laughs> we'll close it out with Wizard Jam this weekend. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, we will be back next week. And if you would like to send us mail to possibly be read next week or in some future week, uh, you can do so to questions at idlethumbs.net. We're also on Twitter at idlethumbs. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash idlethumbs. Uh, we are on iTunes and Google Play and Stitcher and all those places. And if you do appreciate this podcast, please tell a friend. And uh, especially if you want to help us out on iTunes, leave us a reviewer rating. That helps a lot and will help us on the uh, those charts that people use to find podcasts to listen to. And yeah, as Jake said, we'll be here on Saturday to stream the Wizard Jam games. That is again at noon Pacific on Saturday, June 11th on our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash idle thumbs and Nick and hopefully myself will also be returning to dark souls and or other games in the near future. So keep an eye on our Twitch channel and Twitter and the uh, streaming thread on the forums for that. Thanks yeah. for listening. Bye. Bye. What Nick? Goodbye. <laughs> Call it Blue Ape. <laughs> it's pronounced Blue Ape Extreme. <laughs> it's pronounced Tronk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nick, you don't know the secrets of Tronk. Oh, no, it's Crystal. It's oh, good. Okay. The secrets of Tronk. <laughs> good. This episode is brought to you by Tronk. Follow Tronk Official on Twitter for the latest Tronk news.